Good morning Interweb, World Builders Log 5. Today we are going to start work on our habitable planet, but first, as always, some follow-up. First up, the apparent size and brightness tab has a critical error in it. Shout out to the people who spotted it. Such that, as it currently stands, any section below this banner here is kind of useless. Don't use it. I've been struggling for like a week or so to try and get it fixed and I've been failing miserably. So, astronomers, any astronomers in comments, will you send me an email? I could really do with talking to someone in the know on this. And hopefully with a professional's help, we can get this sorted. Apologies, everyone, and I will let you know when this is updated and fixed. But again, for now, do not use any of these sections. Next up, I made an off-air change to the planetary system that we were building in the previous video. Nothing major, all I did was get rid of this rocky planet here to keep to our original two rocky planets and two gas giants idea and move it into the asteroid belt, make it become a dwarf planet, much like uh, Ceres in our asteroid belt. The reference doc has been updated. Check out Patreon, links in the description to get your hands on this. We now have an updated planetary system map with our little dwarf planet in the asteroid belt and our little Pluto analog out in the Kuiper belt. We also have some updated galaxy artwork, which I think just looks so great. And we have an updated stellar neighborhood page. Again, loving this map here. And also a section on the various attributes of each of the systems we created in our stellar neighborhood. Again, if you're interested in getting your hands on this doc, head on over to Patreon. All right, those are the updates. A bit of follow-up from the last episode, Daniel Bamberger, shout out, making a triumphant return. I did in fact misunderstand what you were saying about the asteroid belts. So it doesn't actually impact the build we did in the previous video, but for anyone interested in exactly how to play with multiple asteroid belts, just pause here, check out this comment. I finally get it now. <laughs> I did not get it before. So thanks everyone for the continued feedback. Now, without further ado, let us crack on to our planet. So the first thing to consider is mass, density, radius, and gravity. In my opinion, the four most important parameters when it comes to constructing planets. Mass, pretty self-explanatory. It's how massive the planet is. The range for terrestrial planets is about 0.1 to 10 Earth masses. Though for habitable terrestrial planets, the range is a bit smaller, about 0.1 to 3.5 Earth masses. And the reason being that some scientists think that the more you increase the mass, the more plate tectonics are suppressed. And having active plate tectonics is really important because they're an important geochemical process that informs habitability. So if your habitable world is in the 0.1 to 3.5 Earth mass range, you should be good. Next up, density. Again, very self-explanatory. This is how dense your planet is. For me, this is the most important characteristics to determine. Like, we're building a habitable world, right? So we'd like it to have a, an iron core so that the planet can have a magnetic field so it has shielding from charged solar radiation. We'd also like it to have a molten silicate mantle upon which our plates can move. Therefore, we would need to give our planet a density that reflects those materials. Now, silicate rock has a density of about 3 grams per centimeter cubed. Pure iron has a density of about 8 grams per centimeter cubed. I think the actual value is like 7.8, 7.9. So, for habitable worlds, we'll need to choose a density inside that range. 3 grams per centimeter cubed to 8 grams per centimeter cubed. And you'll see Earth is in that range. Earth is 5.51 grams per centimeter cubed, indicating a composition of iron and silicates. Next up, radius. Again, very self-explanatory. For habitable worlds, you're looking at about 0.5 Earth radii to about 1.5 Earth radii. And gravity, again, very self-explanatory. It's the force of gravity as felt on the planet. Measured in Gs, so relative to Earth. For habitable planets, you're looking at a range of about 0.4 to 1.6 G. Now, to be absolutely clear, that's if you want humans involved. If you're creating a habitable world without any humans involved, these ranges can be extended. But I want humans involved, so I'm going to try and stick to the 0.4 to 1.6 G range. 
So before I plug in some numbers here, I like to kind of ask myself, do I want a high G world or do I want a low G world? Relative to Earth, high G worlds may have smaller creatures, with the opposite being true for low G worlds. The creatures on high G worlds may have fewer, thicker legs. Again, relative to Earth. And again, the opposite is true for low G worlds. This isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's just a kind of tendency that you can choose to go with or ignore. And finally, on a high G world, flight may be easier. On a low G world, flight may also be easier. Reason being that you could argue a thicker atmosphere on a high G world. So more atmospheric density then can mean easier flight. On a low G world, you've less gravity to fight against. So again, easier flight. So taking all that into consideration, I think I'm going to go with a high G world. I put out a Twitter poll last week and by far and away, the super majority voted for low G. So I think I'm going to go against popular opinion here, mainly because I think low G worlds are kind of been kind of sort of done to death. Like any sort of fiction set on the moon or Mars, for example, is a low G setting. James Cameron's Avatar, that's a low G setting because it's on a moon of a gas giant. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other examples, but I can't actually think of a good example of a high G world that immediately springs to mind. So for that reason, I think I'm going to go against what the supermajority voted for. Sorry, guys. I'm going to plug and chug here, see can I achieve a, a high G world while maintaining a density that's conducive to habitability. Uh, time lapse engaged. I'll see you in a few seconds. All right, for now, something like this. So we got, we got a chunky boy here. Mass is 2.7 times the mass of Earth. Density is still relatively comparable to Earth, just slightly more, so I'd expect there is a, there's a slightly bigger iron core. Radius 34% greater, and gravity is about 50% stronger on this world than it is on Earth. I think for now, I'm, I'm happy with that. Next up, escape velocity. This isn't going to play too much a role for me, but for people who are doing like an interstellar sort of setting, it could play a role. Escape velocity is basically how fast you need to be traveling in order to escape the gravitational pull of the planet. The higher the escape velocity, the faster you need to be traveling, the more expensive space flight is. Like I said, not bothered too much with that one, so that's cool. Next up, axial tilt. Axial tilt. Boy, do I have a long and sordid history with axial tilt my old nemesis. So the values here range from zero to 180 degrees. And I actually think it's a little bit easier to explain uh, with diagrams. So give me one second, I'm gonna make some diagrams. Right, so here we have a planet and a star. This is the planet when it's, say, we'll call it January. And then this is the planet six months later in, we'll call it June. As it currently stands, the world has zero degrees of axial tilt because we draw a line from the center of the planet to the center of the star, and its rotational axis, the axis about which the planet spins, is perpendicular to that plane. And it's rotating in the same direction as the parent star. Ergo, just by definition, we call that zero degrees of axial tilt. And obviously, with respect to the same reference frame. Now, on a world with zero degrees of axial tilt, there will be no seasons, as you can hopefully see from this diagram. The situation in January looks the exact same as the situation in June. The most direct sunlight is at the equator. The least direct sunlight is up near the poles. Same deal six months later, or half a year later. No change, therefore no seasons. In order for a world to have seasons, it must have an axial tilt greater than zero. So for Earth, Earth's axial tilt is about 23.5 degrees which looks a little something like this. So now what's happening is that in January, the Southern Hemisphere is pointed towards the sun. Therefore, it receives the most direct sunlight. And half a year later in June, the Northern Hemisphere is pointed towards the sun. Therefore, it receives the most direct sunlight, giving us seasons. Note that the direction of the spin is still generally in the same direction as the parent star. This is called prograde motion, by the way. And also note that because of a non-zero axial tilt, there are regions on the planet that experience constant day and constant night. 
So for example, in January here, if you're standing near the pole and you're rotating around this axis here, you're never going to come in contact with the sun. Ergo, it's constant nighttime up at the poles in the Northern Hemisphere in January. Half a year later, if you're up at the pole here, and again, the planet is spinning around this axis, you are always going to be in sunlight. You're never going to be out of sunlight. So you have constant day. Again, a phenomenon that only occurs if a world has some degree of axial tilt. The more we increase the axial tilt, like let's say we go up to 40 degrees of axial tilt, like so, the same phenomenon hold, it's just that seasonality is more pronounced. The further you go away from zero degrees of axial tilt, the more seasonality a planet will experience. Now, weird things start to happen above about 45 degrees of axial tilt. Like at about 54 degrees of axial tilt, the poles will receive more solar radiation averaged out throughout the year than the equator, which is the opposite situation of what happens on Earth. And the seasons will be like extremely pronounced. But a stable climate state with an ice cap limited to the equatorial region is unlikely which is just like incredibly weird and advanced. So I would just not go near high obliquity. It's called worlds. I would argue to keep your axial tilt below 45 degrees. But for the brave, if we go to 90 degrees of axial tilt, we get to like weird territory. Namely, if you notice the spin, the spin isn't spinning in the same direction as the parent star. It's actually perpendicular. Again, with respect to this reference frame. By convention, we say that the spin of the planet then is undefined. At precisely 90 degrees of axial tilt, the planet's spin is undefined. It is neither in the same direction as the parent star, nor the opposite direction, because it's perpendicular. Worlds with 90 degrees of axial tilt are just hella weird. Now, if we go beyond 90 degrees of axial tilt, like let's say we go to 156.5, we see that the spin of the planet now, with respect to this reference frame, is in the opposite direction to the parent star. So the planet is said to be spinning retrograde. And the kind of cool consequence of this is that sunsets and sunrises will be reversed. So on a prograde planet, the sun will rise in the east and set in the west. However, those are defined. And on a retrograde spinning planet, it'll do the opposite. It'll rise in the west and set in the east. And then finally, if we go all the way up to 180 degrees of axial tilt, we're basically back where we started, perpendicular to the plane between the center of the planet and the center of the sun, except the spin is now retrograde. So there's no difference between a planet with zero degrees of axial tilt and 180 degrees of axial tilt, except for the spin direction. So to summarize all of that, zero degrees of axial tilt, prograde spin, no seasons. 100 degrees of axial tilt, retrograde spin, no seasons. As we move away from 0 and 180 degrees, seasonality is introduced. The more we move away, the stronger the seasons. Above 45-ish degrees, weird things happen to the climate. Be very careful if you choose to go down that road. And at exactly 90 degrees of axial tilt, the planet spin is undefined because its direction is perpendicular to the spin of the star. God, I hope that all made sense. Axial tilt is just such a nightmare to try and explain. Anywho, so what sort of axial tilt do I want for my planet? So I'll keep a prograde spin for now. We can change it later if we want. So that means I'm choosing axial tilt between zero and 90 degrees. I want seasonality, so it has to be greater than zero. And, and realistically, I kind of want to keep it almost Earth-like because again, the more you deviate, the less and less modern day climate zones will apply to a planet. So I am going to just, maybe just vary this by a degree or two, uh, maybe two degrees, maybe like 21, 21 degrees, maybe. So it's almost like Earth, except the seasonality is ever so slightly reduced. Things are just ever so slightly more mellow, but by and large still Earth-like, thus meaning that I can draw on modern day climate zones. Like I said, direction is prograde, cool. Spins in the same direction as its parent star, but respect to the same reference frame. Our world's tropics, i.e. the area bounded by the equivalent of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, go from 21 degrees south to 21 degrees north on our world. And in this region, there will be at least one day per year where the sun is directly overhead. Now, that is what defines the tropics. I.e. in this region, it's hella hot. Our polar circles, 
go from 69 to 90 degrees north and south. These are the hella cold regions. And within these regions, there'll be at least one day per year where the sun will either never set or never rise. Okay, next up, rotation period. Basically, how long is a day on a planet? Uh, lots to unpack here as well, so bear with me. In general, the faster a planet rotates, i.e. the shorter its day is, the more evenly heated that planet will be. Conversely, the slower a planet rotates, i.e. the longer its day is, the less even the heating of the planet will be. So if you imagine a planet that's spinning infinitely fast, it's not possible, but just go with me. Any given point on the surface of the planet, when it comes in contact with the sun's rays, that point won't have a chance to heat up very much because the rapid spin will take it out of the sun's rays really quickly. Similarly, it also ha won't have much time to cool down when it's not being directly hit by the sun's rays because the spin will drag it back under the sun's rays again very rapidly, such that that point never gets like extremely hot nor extremely cool. It's just an even sort of heating, and that applies for all points on the planet. Now, if you imagine a planet that spinned like infinitely slowly, any given point on the surface of that planet will be under the sun's rays for like a hella long time and will continue to heat up and heat up and heat up, becoming just incredibly hot. And when the spin takes that point out of the path of the sun's rays, it will have a long, long, long time to cool down because of how slow the planet is spinning. So that point on the planet goes from the extremes of being cooked to a crisp when in contact with the sun's rays to being frozen solid when it's not in contact with the sun's rays. A very uneven heating of the planet occurs. Again, I hope that makes sense. Fast spin, even heating, slow spin, uneven heating. Another relevant point is that spin informs what the atmosphere is doing. The slower the spin, the less circulation cells in the atmosphere. The faster the spin, the more circulation cells, by and large. Again, this will play a role in climate. So for Earth-like worlds, we'd like to try and have three circulation cells, like on our planet, the Hadley cell in the tropics, the feral cell in the temperate zone, and the polar cell in the Arctic and Antarctics. We'd like three cells per hemisphere. So we'd like to pick a spin that gives us three cells per hemisphere. Very roughly, this means that the sort of habitable range for rotation periods here is about six to 48 Earth hours. But, but it's worth considering why you're world building here. Like if you're just world building for you as a sort of like intellectual hobby or whatever, go mad. Six to 48, choose anything you want. If you're world building for an audience, like you're writing a book, a game, etc., I'd be very reticent to mess with people's concept of time. Like for example, let's say you make a world and it's got a three hour day, right? It rotates really, really quickly. And your, protag your protagonist is a skilled baker, say. You're writing a story about them and you include a line that says, protagonist spent all day baking a small cake, which sounds, you know, really unimpressive for a skilled baker. You, what, you, you spend 24 hours baking a small cake. I thought you're good at baking cakes. And then you remember, oh wait, no, a day on this planet is three hours. So they actually just spent three Earth hours baking cake, which is about normal. See what I mean? So like if you want people to engage with your work, I'd consider keeping the rotation period quite literally what Earth is. So you're not constantly asking people to do mental arithmetic to convert between what we think an hour and a day is and what an hour and a day is on your world. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to hold it at 24 Earth hours. For now, when we do calendar building stuff, I, I might move around depending. But uh, yeah, for now, I'm going to stick with this. So there's no confusion about time and no one has to do mental arithmetic to convert. All right, that's rotation period. Now, albedo, greenhouse effect and surface temperature we looked at in a previous video. So we don't need to look at them. Distance to horizon. This is, this is kind of not very useful. It's just a fun little bit of flavor text you can use. You input the height of an observer here. So like technically it's the height from the ground to the eye level of the observer, but really just put in your height there. Uh, for Americans, six foot is about 1.83 uh, meters. 
So I'm about 1.75. So if I were to stand on the surface of this planet, I could see a distance of 5.48 kilometers, which is more than Earth. Now, this does not take into account atmospheric refraction and all that sort of jazz. This is kind of just a very loose sense of how far you can see. Um, not that important, but like I said, fun flavor text. And now we're on to the terrestrial planet orbital characteristics. We already know the semi-major axis of our planet's orbit because we built a planetary system. There the fella is. But we have not yet worked out any of this section. So let's do that. Eccentricity. Orbital eccentricity is a value that goes from zero to one and it marks out how elliptical an orbit is. All orbits are elliptical. That's just like a law. It's one of Kepler's laws. Therefore, all orbits have to be greater than zero or less than one. At zero, the orbit is a perfect circle. That's not allowed. And at one, the orbit is a parabola. So it's not orbiting at all. It'd be like a flyby sort of thing. So it has to be less than one. Orbital eccentricity of any planet should be greater than zero and less than one. And on top of that, it should be really, really, really close to zero because most major planets orbit on near circles. They're still ellipses, but they're nearly circles. So a very, very small eccentricity. FYI, this is Earth's eccentricity, 0 0.0167. So again, very close to zero. The spreadsheet then takes that eccentricity, applies it to the semi-major axis to figure out how close your planet comes to the star, known as perihelion or periapsis, and how far away your planet gets from the star, known as aphelion or apoapsis. And the key thing here is that for habitable worlds, at no point should your world get out of the habitable zone. So for example, our habitable zone goes from 4.1 AU to 2 AU, roughly. And even if our planet is at its closest or at its most distant, it will still always be in that zone. Because again, dipping out of the habitable zone can lead to issues with habitability. So try and keep everything inside the habitable zone. I'm going to mess with this for a second just to get some other spread. I think I might reduce the eccentricity to just, again, mellow things out. So there's less of a temperature extreme between when the planet is closest to the star and further away. Time lapse engaged. There you go, something like that. So the closest my planet gets is 1.67 AU. The furthest away it gets is 1.70 AU. On average, its distance is 1.69. That's the definition of kind of a semi-major axis. Now, I didn't plan this, but the orbital period, like how long it takes to complete its orbit, i.e. a year on this world, is almost exactly two Earth years. Again, not planned, but kind of happy little coincidence. 1.98 Earth years, aka 726 Earth days. Again, I'm not too pushed about these exact numbers. They're cool. I'm fine with it. Onwards. Inclination. So inclination, again, this is another one that's a little bit complicated to explain. I mean, it's easy in the sense of like for a habitable world, it's zero, period. But there's a little bit more nuance to it. So I think it's graphics time. Hold on. Give me two seconds. All right, here we go. We got a star. We got a planetary system orbiting said star and this thing here this is the center of the galaxy couple of different ways we can measure inclination here we can draw a line between the center of the star and the center of the galaxy let's just call that the galactic plane for the sake of it and we can measure the angle between the galactic plane and the plane of the orbit of a given planet and call that the planet's inclination so respect to the galactic plane green planet here is inclined x degrees same thing with orange planet we could do something like this and it would have this inclination and for blue planet same thing again and it would have that inclination you can do that totally fine but what i would suggest doing is taking your habitable world say this guy and just setting its inclination to zero degrees that means we're defining the plane of its orbit as being the baseline from which we're going to measure the inclination of all the other planets. So orange planet here is going to be inclined X degrees with respect to the habitable world's orbital plane. Same thing for blue planet here, would be inclined Y degrees with respect to that orbital plane. So I set the habitable world's orbital inclination to zero degrees and then all other planets give them an inclination with respect to the habitable world's orbital plane. 
Now, in general, uh, planetary systems tend to be a little bit like uh, like pizza. You know when people spin pizza dough, like they throw it up in the air and they spin it? That spin causes the pizza to flatten. You can think of planetary systems as being like that. They are spinning, so we'd expect the planets to be fairly flat with respect to the star. I, we wouldn't expect like really highly inclined orbital eccentricities, at least for the major inner planets of a system. So I would say for inclinations that aren't your habitable world, maybe less than 10 degrees is probably the way to go. So you get that like flat planetary system. All right, again, I hope that made sense. Zero degrees, I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna define, I'm defining basically the ecliptic. You could Google that if you want. That's what defines the ecliptic. So zero degrees for our habitable world. And because we're between, much like axial tilt, between zero and 90 degrees, we have a prograde spin. So that means our habitable world orbits in the same direction as the spin of the star, which is what you want. If you were to go above 90 degrees, between 90 degrees and 180 degrees, you would get a retrograde orbit, which is weird. And I wouldn't do it for inner system planets. You'd save that for like crazy Kuiper Belt objects and things like that. All right, so that is orbital characteristics done. That is that is the physical characteristics and the orbital characteristics done, at least for now. Final thing to consider, or penultimate thing to consider, is the atmospheric characteristics. Now, this being a basic calculator, the assumption here is that your atmosphere is comprised of nitrogen and oxygen, predominantly, exactly like Earth's atmosphere. If you're going for some mad mix of chemicals, this is not the spreadsheet for you. So, atmospheric pressure. This is the pressure at sea level, measured in atmospheres. At sea level on Earth, on average, we experience one atmosphere of pressure. Now you can choose to change up the atmospheric pressure, but it is based on the gaseous content of your atmosphere. Because like nitrogen and oxygen, very cool. We love those gases. But at the wrong pressure, they could lead to like nitrogen narcosis. And I can't remember for the life of me what the equivalent is for oxygen poisoning. So the pressure needs to be informed by the percentage of gases in your atmosphere. And if we twiddle on over here, sorry, this might be a little bit small for you guys to see, but depending on the content of oxygen, there's a range listed here for potential atmospheric pressures. So let me go to the oxygen tab here. I'm gonna drop this a little bit. I'm just gonna say with 20% oxygen say. Again, I'm keeping things really Earth-like, but just tweaking things a little bit. So at 20% oxygen, I could have atmospheric pressure at sea level between 0.48 atmospheres up to 2.72 atmospheres. Let me just put in the max here and we'll see where we go. So at 2.72 atmospheres at sea level, the atmospheric density on our planet is 3.34 kilograms per meter cubed. On Earth, the equivalent is about 1.23 kilograms per meter cubed. So the atmosphere is a, just a little bit less than three times as dense as it is on Earth. That's going to be useful for flying. So I'd like a high atmospheric density. So that's good. Now, next thing to check is the partial pressure here. Again, there's bounds. You don't need to know what partial pressure means, but there's bounds on these figures. And they tell you if you have too much of any one gas in the atmosphere. So 20% of my atmosphere is oxygen, leading to a partial pressure of 0.54 atmospheres. And according to my ranges here, that is not good. That falls outside the 0.16 to 0.5 atmosphere range. So we're in danger of poisoning or causing ill effect to our inhabitants. So I am going to either I decreased oxygen or decreased atmospheric pressure. Let me decrease the atmospheric pressure a little bit. Okay, so now we're we're right up there. Actually, I'm going to decrease it just a little bit further. Yeah, maybe maybe something like that. Okay, so the partial pressure of oxygen is good. No ill effects will be suffered. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide at optimal should be less than 0 0.005, which we have. We're good. Partial pressure of argon less than 1.6 atmospheres, which we have. It's really hard to have the partial pressure of argon get into dangerous levels, so generally that's fine. And the partial pressure of nitrogen in our atmosphere should be less than three atmospheres, so we're good there as well. 
And again, we have a high atmospheric pressure. It's about maybe 2.5 times that of Earth at the moment, which is good. Now, the other thing I want to consider, we had mentioned back in a previous video that our greenhouse effect on this world needed to be quite strong. So to do that, I'm going to ramp up the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Because if we keep just, if we have just an Earth-like level of carbon dioxide, our planet will be seriously cold. So let's just ramp that up. So I'm going to go, what happens if we double it? Okay, we could go a little bit more. That's about as high as I'm willing to go. Let me just drop that a little bit. Something like that. Yeah, I want to be below 0 0.005 atmosphere. Because again, for humans, um, above a partial pressure of 0 0.005 for carbon dioxide can lead to like um, physiologi physiological effects. So we're still good on the partial pressures. Yeah, less than three. Argon's just always fine. That's fine. That's fine as well. Yeah, so far, happy with that. Here we have our atmospheric circulation cells. We've already taken care of all this because our rotation period is exactly like Earth. It's in the 6 to 48th hour rotation period range. We would expect there to be three cells, circulation cells in the hemisphere. We'll talk more about these in future videos, just like modern they are. So we're gravy there, not a bother. And final, final thing is the sky color and the plant color. Now, there was a version of the spreadsheet long ago before the release of this series where I like literally created formulae to um, spit out colored cells to uh, show the color of the sky and plants. But it was actually just a much better solution to link to the this site called Panoptes 5. Great site. So let's have a quick gander at our sky color. All right, very pretty. There's no way I could include anything like this in a spreadsheet. Shout out to the creator of Panoptes 5. I don't know who you are, but you are great. So to figure out what our sky is doing, we need to know the spectral class of our star, which I have forgotten. So hold on. Oh yes, it's an F5.5 star. So if we go back to our color of alien skies, we're basically this. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Yeah, there we go. We are basically this here. And our atmosphere is, what was our atmosphere again? Our atmosphere, the pressure of our atmosphere was 2.3 times. So we are closer to this column here, the three atmospheric pressure column. So our sky will look like this. So this circle here, the circles on the left are what happens when the star is high in the sky. And this is what happens when the star is low in the sky. So that's kind of cool. Uh, an Earth, but I should say Earth. This is Earth here, roughly. Somewhere in between these two cells here is what Earth looks like. So our dude here, we're looking at a more sky blue sky. And close to the horizon, we're looking at being it a lot whiter. And then at sunset, we're looking at kind of a darker sky overall, with more red hues uh, near the horizon. So that is kind of cool. That's an unexpected result. I didn't realize we're going to get sort of a sky blue type colors. That's kind of dope. Really like it. And the final thing, uh, again, coming from Panoptus 5, is the color of alien plants. And I'm really disappointed. Oh no. Okay, so spectral class, we're f5.5, so we're somewhere here. We are we're, we're closer to, to f6, So and we're closer to three atmospheric pressures. So we're looking at plants in this, they look kind of green, which is a bit disappointing. Uh, I guess you could argue these are more yellow. Um, so that's not great. I'd kind of like them to be this color here. Like it'd be cool to have kind of like turquoisey plants. So that means I need to be closer to one atmosphere pressure. So uh, time lapse engage. I'm going to rejigger some of the atmosphere. See, can I get a color I like better? Yeah, maybe something like that. It's sad that I'm losing all this atmospheric density. Okay. Sure. Maybe. I'll have to dwell on that. Okay, so we're closer to one now than we are to uh than we are to three. So we could buy this methodology here. We could say that our plants are kind of a turquoisey color, which I kind of like. So that's better. What does that do to our sky color? Uh one atmospheric pressure. And we are, we're basically the same as the sun, basically. Um, 
which trade-offs here what do i like better do i like a sky that looks kind of more alien or plants that look more alien i think plants are probably the way to go so we have an earth-like sky slightly bluer when the sun because again the sun is roughly this so slightly bluer when the sun is low in the horizon and we have turquoisey turquoisey plants um which i think is quite cute all right cool i think that is that is that everything for now i think it is god that was a lot that was a lot okay that is that thank you all so much for watching thank you to all the patrons for patronizing the channel links in the description if you want to check it out and a final shout out as always to the wonderful vanga van gogh who is supplying the artwork for this series go check them out on deviantart they are open for commissions so hit them up tell them i sent you have a great one folks until next time, Edgar out.